Welcome to Be The Revolution podcast, presented by GM Revolution, a men's skincare line dedicated to helping them change the world. Hi friends, it's me, your host Michael. Today on the podcast, I'm joined with a good friend, Matt Sheldon. Matt was kind enough to come on the podcast and share his super inspirational story of how by the time he was only one year out of college, he had started four successful companies. In this episode, we talk about what it means to be a young entrepreneur, the importance of learning from failure, and the creativity it takes to pivot your business model in an uncertain time. So, without further ado, let's head to the interview. All right, hello everyone. I'm here today with my friend Matt Sheldon, and today we're going to talk a little bit about his journey and his unique story of how he has since he graduated college, started four companies and been a part of four companies. And we really just want to have a conversation today about what that has meant for him in a non-traditional career path. Hello. Thank you for having me. Of course. Good to have you We're here. excited. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of want to start with just telling the listeners a little bit about yourself, maybe your background, kind of touch on what you're doing, what you've done in the past. Sure. Yeah. I guess a lot of different things. Um, Originally from Lockport, Illinois, which is a suburb just outside of Chicago. Not really just outside, but like 35 miles out. Everyone says Chicago. Everyone does. You got to say the suburb. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I grew up smaller town, uh, went to public high school. Um, and then when it came to college, I honestly just was anti, not anti-college, but just didn't have, you know, a plan and just was more flying by the seat of my pants, which is not really how I am now. Um, but the big thing was my mom worked at Lewis university. She still does. And with that, I had some, um, nice perks of being able to go to school on this list of schools for free. And at Lewis, um, and so with that being said, some, most of the schools were smaller schools, smaller Catholic liberal arts schools, and none of them were like, wow, I want to go there. Um, and then So I decided to go to Lewis and my first semester at Lewis, um, I just, something felt off. Um, I was visiting um, a friend at the time at St. Mary's and uh, saw that she was having a lot of fun. So I visited her a lot and um, that was kind of like eye opening. It's like people are having this awesome experience and college is something that people should be like, can't wait to go back. And for me, I just, didn't have that. And I felt it was wrong. I talked to my mom and one thing came to another, I was transferred, uh, or I transferred to Holy Cross College, which is right next to Notre Dame. Um, I was the first tuition exchange program mid year ever that they've ever had at the school. I guess they took a good leap and (laughs) it worked out. Um, so that worked out. I transferred and then I just really found my, found myself at Holy Cross and the people there were so supportive of everything that I was doing. Um, and I met a kid named Tommy and we started our first company, which was teen, our websites. That's what it was. And we started going out to local businesses while I was a freshman at college and just selling them on a website. So this is right when you transferred right off the bat. This was, yeah, it, it maybe a month or two into college. And I just started, like he, he had this thing that he was working on and he was like, I think you could help me sell. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So we just went out to restaurants and we landed our first client. I'll never forget. Sauce's Mexican grill. <laughs> they have great margaritas on Wednesdays for two bucks a piece. Um, but we started talking to him about like, Hey, we can do this. We can do that. And we, we sold them the day we talked to him and said, Hey, we'll build you a website. And he's like, all right, let's do it. So we came in right at the perfect time. And that was like our first real, like, entrepreneurial the success we were so pumped still remember we were like playing music on the ride home going crazy and so that was when we had to start building it we we in the grand scheme of things we built him a 25 page website for like a thousand bucks which and also included a, a, a photo shoot everything videos blah 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 and it was like this is just like any other agency would have charged like five. So he was getting a deal. That's probably why he said yes when we first met him. So anyways, we learned a lot. We were on a photo shoot. Our camera died. We went and bought one and just like started building things up. And that company 
uh, we ended up going away from each other after that. But that was like, I'd say like my first real like entrepreneurial experience. And I guess that's kind of why I started with that as like the start of my journey, because it kind of put it in my head that it's a lot better in my mind to work for yourself than it is to like just go get a job. So, yeah. So you graduated from Holy Cross in 2019. And since then, you've started or co-founded or been a partner of four different companies. So what is it about, do you just have, do you, are you just so opposed to working for someone else? What is it that you have just refused to take that traditional career path? Yeah, I think, and people might disagree, but I think it's the easiest time to start a business is actually when you're in college because you have the safety blanket of maybe your federal aid or your parents paying for your school and you don't have to really stress about making ends meet. At least I didn't. Some students do. So for me, that's what it felt like. So I could go to class in the morning and then work on the business after. Um, so I guess that like freedom where I could be, still work on things and fail because I have the safety net kind of got me into that like mindset of like, you know, you can do anything you want to type of deal. Um, so my junior year, we uh, were in this program that was the Applied Entrepreneurship Program um, at Holy Cross. And it, it essentially connects kids from all these different schools within the South Bend Elkhart region, shows them what's going on in the community, all the entrepreneurial ecosystem in that area. Um, and in, in the end, you, the goal is to start a business. And at that point in time, like I wasn't super motivated to start another business because we were working on different ideas and blah, blah, blah. Um, but my business partner, Greg and I, um, came across this idea to, um, be like a concierge service for people that are coming in for Notre Dame football games. People spend a lot of money. Like how could you take a piece and serve them better? Uh, so that's what we landed on our first company, which was, uh, touchdown tailgates was the name. And, um, yeah, looking back, I guess, that was the start of the most successful company. Well, at the time, the most <laughs> successful company sure. that we had. Um, but essentially we built a website, we put out a price list and we didn't own any of the equipment we were marketing and essentially had people that were reaching out and saying, Hey, this looks fun. You know, tell me more about it. And I would, I would literally leave class. I would tell my professors, Hey, if I have a phone call, I'm going to leave. Like, this is very important to me. And I would leave class and literally sell to some of these kids that I'm in class with their parents yeah. as if I'm this expert tailgater, you know. And that was kind of like the start of it. And it was just hustle, hustle, hustle. So after that, we had to actually do it. And then the first day, we, we were getting to a point, it's like, we've never done this before. We're getting a lot of orders. Like, when do you stop and when do you like, when do you start saying no? And instead of just saying yes to everybody, cause it's coming in. But the biggest problem was the first game that year was Notre Dame, Michigan. So oh, yeah. it was the biggest game of the year. It's like, if we miss this day with the number of sales, then we're just not going to have that many. I think the second one was FSU or something like that, which is another big one. So anyways, we just kept going and we had, 26 different tailgates on our first day <laughs> in six different parking lots all wow. across Notre Dame. Like if you're familiar, like stadium, Joyce library, innovation park, and then all the way at Holy Cross. Wow. And we had no form of transportation. <laughs> it was 95 degrees. So everyone's ice was melting super fast. And we had a tailgate that was for this really high profile client that was literally nine parking spots big it was the biggest that he's ever seen and it was really cool to succeed even though we failed so so many times and we were running 50 pound generators from stadium to library and so how many people at this point just you and your partner just me, me and greg just you and greg with greg. 26 different tailgates going on yeah so that that's where i gave it to my family and my friends to help that really made it happen we we bought um our, our logo at the time had a hint of orange. Okay. So we had uh, uh, bought these shirts and we didn't want to have green or blue. We wanted to stand out in the parking lot. So that was something I think about is 
at like we got to the lots at 4 30 in the morning with a box truck and six different uh u-haul vans because we thought that'd be the best because we didn't we couldn't afford to buy parking passes to get into the lot so we we're using our customers parking passes to like set up like it was just crazy but anyways everyone was in pink or uh, orange and everyone stood out in the parking lot so we right. started to generate like what the hell are these people in orange right dragging a uh you know, equipment across the lot at five in the morning. Like, what is this? And I'll never forget by the end of that day, we had one of our clients that was like, this is well, most of them, but this is amazing. Like, how does this, this service is great. Like how long have you been doing this for? And I'm like, well, now I can actually tell you it's been 12 hours. <laughs> so that was like, I guess like the first like successful day. Um, sorry, I kind of went off a tangent. But no, no. It's a fun story to tell because it's, I guess you asked kind of like, am I so stuck on working for myself? I think it's more just, I find more motivation when I can see the direct return on the time. Absolutely. Like working and getting a paycheck for some people that's fine because you can unplug. Like there's a lot of advantages to working for yourself and there's a lot of disadvantages. Like I'm on texting my business partners, 24 seven, literally all the time. You wake up, what's this going on? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you don't really shut off. We've gotten better now that we're working full time on it. But um, yeah, so I think like that feeling that you can have more impact on your work is what I think like, keeps yeah. you going to that. Yeah. So I picked up on a couple things. I think that a lot of people when they're younger, whether it's high school or college, they've got that motivation that they want to work for themselves, but, and they have the, they have the dream that they want to start their own company, but it feels like they're waiting for divine inspiration. What it sometimes feels like, or a, a lightning bolt to strike them with a genius business plan. And until that idea comes, you kind of feel, you kind of feel helpless and you don't know, like you're so, so motivated, but you don't have anything to put it towards but that wasn't necessarily the case for you. So what, what was that divine inspiration like with you and Greg? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point because everyone can say that they're going to do shit until they actually do shit. Absolutely. I mean, to put it harshly. And um, I think the big thing was, I guess the piece of advice is it doesn't have to be perfect to start it. So like we look back at our, our website when we first got started um, and it was click here for a tent, click here for chairs, you know, not very streamlined, but it, people got it. Like the biggest thing is proving the point. Like mm -hmm. even if you just create a, if you have any concept, like it doesn't have to be perfect to get validation. The biggest point is doing it and learning and validating and asking your customers or even when you're starting something new before you even start anything new, the way you should do it is ask them, Hey, like we went out to the parking lots and talked to people like before we even started the business, this was a year before our first season. So it was like, I remember it was a USC game or the end of my junior year or sophomore year. I haven't mixed the years together, <laughs> but anyways, it was, Hey, what time did you get here this morning? Uh, how much do you usually spend on an average tailgate? If you don't mind asking, you know, uh, what, what, what is your biggest struggle? Like, what is your pain point? Like talking to the people that are actually doing it and understanding like, Hey, this is what I hate about tailgating now is I've got to go here. I got to go buy this liquor. I got to put it on ice. I got to carry it in my car. I got to clean it up. And it's asking those questions and you should ask hundred, hundred people, a hundred prospects before you even start working on an idea unless, but then it, but then there's the, 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 the happy medium to, like you said, is like, you're waiting for the defined province, like start it. But it's, it's, it's a balance between those two is like validating that you actually have a need for your business while also, um, like just getting out there and doing it. Right. I mean, build a price list and send it to people. Like we're doing that now, which we can probably talk on later. It's like, we had nothing, None of the equipment that we were building, we're doing like drive-in movie theaters and stuff. We'll talk later about it, but we just created a one shooter about what we would do. And then we look up the prices on things that we need to buy and how it works. And 
then you build your price list and then you start talking to people, Hey, this is what we're doing. So I think it's just a matter of like, just starting is yeah. the biggest thing is like create a name, the name people spend weeks and months on a name. And it's like that, that time is just completely wasted. Like put together a crap logo, like, like your image to people is big, but if you explain to them, Hey, this is what we're doing. You know, you don't have to be an expert at it before doing it. I mean, right. Most entrepreneurs you talk to is they have the, I mean, I just told you the story. We had seven different vans and now we have one big truck or two big trucks that drop it off. It's just, you start, iterate it, re, you know, figure out what's wrong, how you can improve on better. So I think it was just a, we got lucky because of our marketing to get us to our first um, season. You know, like I said, we had 26 in a day. So it, it wasn't like we, um, like didn't see the validation while the sales were coming, but our second game, we had two, right. You know, Greg and I got out there seven in the morning, we set it up ourselves and that was it. Like, it's not that it was all big in the first day, but then by the end of the season, our next biggest was 41. So it's like, just iterate. And, and, and I think that's the biggest thing is just like getting out there and doing it, fail, 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 fail some more, and then learn what, is going well and what's not and how can you prove that? So I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, absolutely. And so what I'm kind of hearing from you is, you know, first, you know, that divine inspiration, it comes from a problem. And the first step is you have to validate that problem. Talk to as many people as you can. Uh, I always like to think that, you know, our potential customers, they have the answers that we're all looking for. You just have to ask them Yeah. and you have to let them feel around if it's a, MVP that, you know, just create something viable that they can get in front of them, test it out and yeah, be scrappy in the beginning and see where it goes. Yeah. I mean, there's even things online that like everyone is trying to build the next app or like, mm -hmm. this is the next software. And I've tried it a couple of times and it's like, you can go on these websites that like you, you prototype it and it's, it's not actually working in the back end. But you can show the concept right. and just get it working anywhere in your face. Yeah, yeah, it's drag and drop. And it's like building a tech thing is very expensive, but you have to be able to prove what you're going to do before somebody will pay and invest in it. Yeah. So I think, yeah, exactly right. It's just like getting an MVP in front of people or just like, I mean, even as simple as like when I was in high school, I had a. Uh, I worked at Menards and I was the morning stalker. Humble beginnings. And the, and <laughs> no, this was a funny story. And I was the morning stalker in the plumbing section. So I had no clue anything about plumbing, but it was nice. It was like at the time, like 12 bucks an hour or something. And you started at five and you got done at nine in the morning. So it was like you got started. But I started looking at, I had the web design stuff going at this time. Or no, I didn't. This might even been the first thing. But I saw window washing kit. I saw the window washers going at the windows at Menards. I'm like, I wonder how much window washers make. <laughs> so I look it up and they make damn good money, like forty five <laughs> to sixty dollars an hour. And I was like, Okay, this kit is thirty five bucks, I could buy this and then I'll start a windows washer. So it was like Sheldon's washer. <laughs> but I went on Vista print, bought some shirts, some business cards, started handing them out, and then I realized the thing to pair with it is the the power washer. So I was like, how much power washers make? They make a lot of money too. So then I started power washing people's siding and then you sell them on like, oh, your, your windows are going to get dirty when I power wash. So let me do Might windows, well do the windows as toss well. it in. And it, that was like the MVP is like, I just, I was like, mom, I'm going to clean our windows today. So that was how I learned. I just did yep. it on my mom. I'm not very good at it, but <laughs> the clients didn't know. But so yeah, just to the point of just like, create MVP, just do it before thinking yeah. about it so much. And that's, it's kind of the same story with that one of your first clients where, you know, when you finally get to tell them, oh, I've been doing this for 12 hours. You know, they don't have to know that. No, you know, it's all you about just, how you sell it. Right. You just go out and do it. And, you know, if they like it, they like it. And if not, you failed, you can learn from it and move on and be better next time. Yeah. And we've, we've failed a lot. I think I did, I think we talked to our, the applied entrepreneurship program and they were like, how do you, or what was your biggest failure? Or I can't even say that word failure <laughs> or whatever. 
I was like, I don't really have one. I think I, my mind is like, you fail every day and we failed today. We hired somebody new and she came in for her first day and we didn't have a lot of it prepared. So it was like, we lost money on that and now I'll never fail. I'll make sure I'll get up earlier next time and get it to them. But just the idea of like, um, what was I saying before I lost my train of thought? Um, just the idea of, you know, showing them value and if it works, it works. But not. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. Um, it was, it's just how you sell it. So it's right. like you pose yourself as the expert and then you figure it out later. Yeah. And then if you don't figure it out, I mean, that's your name on that and you're going to, Right answer to it, but honestly, worst comes to worst, you refund them, you figure it out. Like, yeah, we've lost money on things, and that was the first big thing we lost was the the USC game. We had a this was our second year, and we had a client that we were doing a a luxury bus for. A very high end client. I won't say his name because it's kind of embarrassing <laughs> that I did this for him. But, um, anyways. We had a, a bus company that was supposed to pick up our very high-end client. We were so honored. We got to serve somebody of this caliper. We put together this full package of a tailgate, um, full food on the bus, drinks on the bus, server, these things like a sp space jet or a private jet on wheels, you know, 10 TVs, kitchen, bathroom. Like, you walk on, it's amazing. So we... We start and the bus driver can't get under bridges <laughs> and we're getting calls. This is, this is our biggest game ever. It was 60 tailgates in one day. Jeez. So we were already stressed. The wind was blowing 30 miles an hour. None of our TVs were working and our TV packages are like $600 a TV. So we had all these things not working. Tents were blowing over, sh sh like just smashing tents. We had to take them down. Weights. It was just... It was, a, it was an eye opener. Like, wow, we really need to um, make sure we have these redundancy plans in place, which we do now. But it was a, it was an opening time. But anyways, back to the bus thing. So the guy took four hours to get from Chicago to South Bend. Jeez, that's it's it's an hour and hour and, hour half, and a half max. Drive. Yeah. yeah, and it was like he's already pissed off. He's we're we're trying to get him off, and the biggest problem is he had forty five minutes to tailgate. Mm. And he paid all this money for the tailgate, and now he's got 45 minutes. So, I mean, that was like, we were at like the point of tears. Like, we were just sitting there, like, we worked all this time and all this effort, and that was like our biggest, You get the like, dream client. Yeah, and then you messed it up, and yep. then you got to figure out, you know, how to salvage it. And you lose money when you salvage things, and that was like a big, like, all right, now... Next time when we sell a TV, if it doesn't work, they know it's not going to work. You know, I guess the biggest thing was managing expectations. Sure. Is like, Absolutely. we're going to give you this TV. There's still a chance it might not work if there's wind or storms or whatever. But if you tell somebody it's going to work and it doesn't work, you look bad. Yeah. It's just about how you, you know, um, say that. So that was like the biggest failure. Yeah. I still can't say the word, but <laughs> the biggest failure that I, you know, had with the business and stuff, but it's. Like you said, it's just overcoming that and, right. and figuring it out. Yeah. And I think, you know, especially when you're working on a project with a client, managing expectations is probably the most important aspect to the entire project. And that starts from your first interaction with the client Yep. and exactly how you present what value you're going to bring. And so I've always been to the mindset that, you know, under promise and over deliver. Yeah. hundred percent. And just overwhelm the client with value. And however that may be for whatever project or business you're working on, just overwhelm the client in ways that they didn't expect. Yeah, and that's a hundred percent. And it's it's one thing to sell, like we like we were talking before, like just get there and sell and tell, like like we were selling before we started or had any of the equipment. And then it's it's also different to promise the world and not actually be able right. to do it because if you if if, if in, in that contract, I mean, this is, you're saying this is what you're going to do. When you do more than that, you look for like, great. But if you're saying you're going to do the top line of the work and then you miss a couple things, you look bad. Right. It's, but 
like, especially with like being your own boss or doing your own thing, you can manage those expectations before. And I think that's the biggest, yeah. that's what, you're exactly right. Working with any client. Yeah. So you're in college and you're working with this tailgate company at Notre Dame specifically. Now, fast forward two, three, four years down the line, you've had clients at Soldier Field in Chicago. What else are you doing now? Yeah. So after our first year or during our first year, we were already trying to get bought. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> during, <the> our, <laughs> during our first year, I this is how I think another key like thing that I think about is like, the power of networking is the most powerful thing ever in anything. Friendships, success, business-wise, everything. And I look back, and all this started from a kid that I played baseball with, his neighbor. And we <laughs> used to play backyard baseball together, and that's how I met him. We'd go to their lake house, um, and, and then we'd meet each other there. And anyways, so we weren't like friends, friends, but we knew of each other. My cousins knew him, and then uh, um, he worked for my now business partner, and John Murray um, is my current business partner, and the gentleman that reached out to us during our first year, and he has a, another company called Arena Partners, and they do larger scale brand consulting, um, larger event production, and they owned a company that was the official tailgate partner in Soldier Field called Exclusive Event Experiences. Um, so they reached out to us and we were just telling the story today. Um, at the time, I only got his email that, you know, looked him up and it looked as a brand consultant and, and um, whatever. So we thought that he was just trying to help us grow and we were like, I'm not sure about this guy. And we kind of pushed him off. Then he followed up again and says, hey, can I, can I, um, show you the product this weekend at my tailgate for the bears. And we're like, how do you show a brand consulting product at the, the, the tailgate? So then he sent us the link, put two and two together. Um, the arena club at soldier field, um, is an all inclusive tailgate. All you can drink, all you can eat really high end tailgate, mainly targeted towards corporate clientele that are trying to, um, entertain their clients without spending, you know, 50, $60,000 on a suite. They can, you know, do an authentic tailgate. And the biggest thing we sell is it most of the time, if you've ever been to a suite in a football game or baseball game, you show up a half an hour before you have some drinks. The food's not that good. It's right. just burgers and hot dogs. Yep. Um, we take that to the next level. Our guests um, arrive anywhere from two, two and a half hours to three hours before the game. So that's huge for clients that want to network with their people. So anyways, I went there. Um, I'll never forget this day. Greg was in Fort Wayne. That was another part of our first year. Greg lived in Fort Wayne, was working on another job, going back and forth for every football game. Didn't make any money at that job. It was just miserable. But anyways, it's a tangent. But anyways, he was he was in Fort Wayne, and uh, at the time, he's like, dude, it's like a four-hour drive for me. Like, just go to this tailgate, figure it out, and we'll go from there. So I went, took my dad. We randomly got tickets from a family friend to go to the game. I'd never been to a, a Bears game before. I've only been to one. Um, but we show up to this tailgate, and it's, like, amazing. Like, it's super cool. There's cooks on site with steaks, cutting it. There's, you know, these amazing garlic breads, complimentary cigars. There's a wine company that's handing out cans of wine for free. It's all-inclusive. There's three premium bars and it's just like music bumping live music and it was like this is sick and he was giving us the tour around and then he's like before you leave let's talk so he starts talking about it and essentially I'll make long story short he has been looking for two young guys that want to take this business over and expand it across the country I was like oh that's why he invited <laughs> us and it was just like I like it was it was like a really cool cool moment for my dad and I to have. And then um, we went to the game and it was like calling Greg, like Greg, like this is crazy, blah, blah, blah. So that was the start of it. And then we took about four months and we negotiated a merger deal with him. So to your point, I guess it was very, 
interesting to negotiate a merger deal when you're a senior in college and it's like really affecting your life on like, oh, if he gets 40% versus 30 and this and that. And it's like, that was where we really relied on our network of people that we had met through the Ripple Fight Entrepreneurship Program that had, you know, hey, let me get you to talk to this guy. And we're talking to lawyers that are $400 an hour for free. And just because we were part of this program. So I give a lot to the Applied Entrepreneurship Program on that. Um, so that was like the start of it. And with that, we, we nailed the deal down in April. I was scheduled to graduate in May. And part of the deal we worked out was we would have enough money to pay ourselves for a little bit so Greg and I could move to Chicago. Uh, and work full time. So we were living the lavish lifestyle. Honestly, we went from, I paid myself $2,000 for my first year and a half of the business. <laughs> and then we were like, you know, making a couple thousand bucks a month or whatever it is. But it was decent money that we could move. And it was eye opening. We were, had an office in River North, like super nice area. Right and, out of college. Yeah. Right out of college. Yeah. And it's like, Life doesn't usually work like this. Right. So we, we got pretty lucky on that because our plan, if we didn't have the merger deal, was work some part-time jobs and then when it comes to football season, like start to pay, pay ourselves. So our first or second, second year in business for the first company and our first year in business to do Chicago and Notre Dame was last year. We had a really good year. I think we increased sales at Notre Dame 100%, and in Chicago, like 70%. So everyone was happy. We made a profit. It was cool. Um, and then, you know, I still live in downtown, so it's like the lifestyle is still fun. And then we really had uh, aggressive plans, to say the least, to expand because the main concept on our expansion was hey, um, we have all this equipment in the warehouse, and when Notre Dame has a slow game, we need to be renting this out at other schools, just how we started at Notre Dame. So we were targeting, went zero to 100 real quick, we were at two, and then by January, we were targeting 11 locations. So it was like, let's just get it started and figure it out. So we were going to do Notre Dame, Wisconsin, and Lambeau. We were going to do uh, the University of Wisconsin and Madison, Lincoln, Nebraska, Iowa State, University of Iowa. University of Illinois, ISU, Northern Illinois, Northwestern, Indiana, and then Notre Dame. So it was, we put on, it's still on our site now, um, but we, we put our a pause on our marketing dollars because it's like, you're going to spend 10 grand marketing and then there's not football season. Right. We, we guessed correctly yep. at this point in time. But, it, but it, what I'm hearing is it was back to the same, oh, we'll figure it out. You know, shoot for the moon and you know, we'll figure it out as we go. Yeah. You, you don't know if you can do, if you can hold 11 locations, but you're going to try. Yeah. And it's, luckily our business isn't rocket science. Like sure. if I said, Hey, I'll give you $500 to drive to Wisconsin, set up four tailgates and drive it home. You might say yes. It depends on what situation in life you're in. Um, so we were looking at it that way. Yeah. It was like, let's just get our name out there. And it instantly adds credibility too when you visit our website and there's 12 locations. It's like, ah, these guys, you know, they're in 12 locations. I did it, they just put up a web page. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm real enough to just say that because it's, we're not, we, we will get it done. If you order a website or if you order a, a tailgate in Nebraska, it'll get there. You will have a tailgate. You know, we will make sure it's done. And then it's just iterating that over and over and over again. Um, so that was, I think March when we had it all, all set right when the COVID was starting to hit and it was by April, we were like, Hey, um, we don't think it's going to be football season. Let's put a pause on our marketing dollars. And we're like, how are we going to survive? Because we need to figure out how to make money with, there's no football season. Like take all a hundred percent of our revenue away. How do you survive? So we started going down this path of. Let's create a new Zoom type platform where you can watch football games together, bet on games all in one platform, you know, have drinks sent to your friends and just starting it. We started iterating it. We started talking to people and then, you know, it came down. It's like, we really don't have a quarter million dollars to build this out and we don't have the time, but how can we, you know, we have no money. 
we stopped paying ourselves. We were on unemployment for like a week or two. So it was like an eye opener. Like, ah, you know, it's not all roses. Welcome to the real yeah. world. Welcome right. to the real world. And it's stressful. I mean, it's, it's like, but then it's, it also gives you the motivation because then it's not like you have this cushion, you know, we could take a weekend off right. before and go on vacation. And now it's like, okay, we have to bring in new clients or we don't have anything. Um, so we landed on this idea to rebrand ourselves because the exclusive event experiences brand was very heavy tailgating. And we launched a new brand, a new, new company called Together, uh, to GTHR. So it kind of play on word. We like to, it's better together. Um, but the big thing is we um, intentionally bring people together um, while creating, you know, lasting connection points. So it's not just, hey, there's a Zoom call to start. You know, we're doing birthday parties where each guest um, gets a kit that it's themed around the birthday party. So then at the end of it, they can all blow their candles together. Or we did one for a girl that was um, a Hawaiian theme party. And we had somebody from Hawaii do a luau lesson for 20 minutes. Just like little things where it's like curating that experience. Um, and similar to the point of what I talked about with the, the drive-in stuff is we were like, hey, these drive-ins are going to be big. Let's figure out how to get into the market. So we don't own a screen, but we have done drive-in movie theaters. So we had a client that... Um, we did a pop-up drive-in movie theater event in their corporate parking lot for 50 or 60 cars. And it was all pop-up. We had bags of kits with branded popcorn, candy, um, you know, little popcorn containers, you know, thinking of everything, wipes, hand sanitizer, just, it was a nice thing that we gave to the, the guest um, for, e for each car. And, it went well, and now you know we can. We've done driving movie theaters, so now we're taking that content yeah. to sell more, whether it's a driving concert, um, and you just it's just there's a lot of conversations like where do we want to go with the business now? Like this is 2020 is probably just a wash, right? As sad as that At is, this point. yeah. Um, but it's like, what can we do to be creative? So another guy that we worked with had an idea. That was like, we should be doing drive-in concerts. And this is right where, um, right when it started popping up. So they did a, a drive-in dubstep rave in Colorado. <laughs> and you're laughing. I'm going to tell you the story. <laughs> they did a drive this is very in-brand for Colorado. <laughs> yeah. And it was a dubstep thing. And it sold out. And we were like... We need to figure this out. Like, let's look at the numbers. So we budgeted it out. Couldn't make the numbers work because you're you're paying just to drop a stage line like twenty grand, and you got to rent the space and pay it. The numbers didn't work out for a pop up. However, we didn't give up, and we were like, what if we had an existing venue that already existed with the projection screen and the parking and blah blah blah. So we reached out to everyone in the area. We actually found one that we did deal with. Um, contracts were signed like last week. Um, so we are doing a drive-in um, concert series in Hoffman Estates, and it will be announced soon. We have the talent locked down for Friday. We've got deposits and contracts. It's going to be a dubstep show. Wow. So <laughs> I am personally not even a dubstep fan, but I think the... Uh, Hopefully Hoffman Estates is. <laughs> yeah, they, but they do EDC there and all, right. you know, yep. all that. So. Yep. We're really excited to launch it. And then um, we are hopefully doing a larger name, which I'll tell you after the name of it uh, once we get it locked down. Um, but a more mainstream EDM, more like radio, probably something that you might listen to. But that'll be on Saturday. So we are now becoming a concert promoter in a sense, which is very risky right. and scary. Um, but it's one of those things It's like, if you don't do this, what are you going to do? And if it goes well, you can really build a brand off of it and continue it because there's so much pent up demand for some type of concert, you know, whether it's a country concert or a rock concert or, you know, our plans are to do more if this goes, you know, well and successful. So, yeah, that is a very long evolution <laughs> of some kids that were running out coolers of ice. And yeah. Tent, and so now, 
we're, we're learning on the fly how to throw a concert and we'll do it. It's going to be 400 cars. If we sell out, it might be 500 cars if we sell out some more. And yeah, I mean, we're just figuring it out. If we don't, we're going to fail pretty bad. <laughs> it's going to hurt. But I'm confident in, and we've been confident in the way we've been planning it and the routes we've been taking. So. Yeah. No, that's it's a great story of how, like you said, you know, two kids in South Bend, you know, you, who, who would have ever thought that you started selling a website to a guy in a Mexican restaurant for $1,000 to now you're putting on tailgates just in South Bend for a Notre Dame Michigan game. And then all of a sudden you're hosting a birthday for a little girl with a Hawaiian uh, luau professional giving a giving a class and then now you're hosting a edm concert in colorado oh, it's mean, hoffman or yeah. hoffman i'm sorry no you're right. hoffman um it, it's it's the crazy story of how you know you're the value proposition is the same across the board you're selling an experience to people yeah. and you know when you when times get tough as they are now especially for in-person experiences you have to get creative of how are we going to still bring that same value? And then you start going down the line of how can we start creating value for different clients and, you know, just different communities. Is it birthday parties? Is it concerts? Is it football games still? Is it online sports betting? Is it online poker? There's just the possibilities are endless, but sometimes it takes that. Sometimes it takes a pandemic for you to really have to get creative in your thought. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's something that everyone asks is what's your why? Like that is something to think about too. It's like, why are you doing what you're doing right now? Or why are you like, what is the why? Like you can say oh, it's for money and then it's, you're not actually enjoying it. Um, but I think my biggest why is like, I love like creating like happiness for people like it's that experience yeah the experience is like it's the best feeling in the world like when you're walking around the the arena club tailgate and like your best friend and her her dad are just having a blast and smoking cigars and and then your client's super happy that you know this turned out great and they're going to tell 10 people about it everything comes down i think to the why of the like you just i love creating like cool experiences for people that they're going to treasure. Even if it's like as simple as like one of my clients that's designing a logo, like this is going to change their business because now they have more of a brand that they're going to market with. And it's, there's the impact there and it's not like you're just going through the motions. And I I, like you hit the nail on the head. There is the, the pandemic. It really took a pandemic to launch a business that we've been talking about doing. Like we wanted to get out of tailgating, but you go down this rabbit hole of, oh, we're adding new locations. Like this is what we're passionate about. We love tailgating. And really it's like the, the pandemic was, okay, I'm going to take away this. Now you need to figure out how you're going to be successful. And it, 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 if we come out of this as a positive, it's like, okay, now we have two businesses that are building a brand one for virtual parties and in-person experiences. And the other one is very specific around tailgating and, you know, to a customer, you know, we're a family of companies, but it's also separate. So it's just like, you can go to market to this person because now, you know, this is our credential deck. We've done a 400 person online gala where each person got this. And we did this drive in movie theater. Here's our sponsor sizzle reel. We're getting to a really interesting point because of when we first started the the new brand, it was an idea, right? And a logo and a website that we spent endless hours on. And then it's now we're getting to the point which we're super excited about is like our first big client went really well. And our second one, we have it on Thursday and I hope it's going to go really well. And it's like, those are going to be extreme case studies that, we can take to sell to more people. And that I think is just exciting to come out of it is now we have two businesses that we can grow. 
and yeah. that's only going to be more successful. So, yeah, I guess I'll, uh, I'll finish this up with one more question. I know hopefully there's a lot of young people listening to this, whether it's high school or college, and they're kind of feeling what you felt and what I felt at the time. Um, so if there was one thing that you could say to those kids or anyone younger that wants to start their own business and that's been their dream, they've got that motivation, what's one thing that you would tell them? I mean, I think we, we kind of touched on it before. It's don't be afraid to fail. Like, mm -hmm. You're going to think about like what your parents or what your friends are going to think about you. Like, oh, I'm starting this clothing brand. And sure. like, you're going to have the second guess of like, well, if it's not a, if I don't have 10,000 followers on Instagram, yeah. like I'm going to be embarrassing to like my friends, but like everyone started with one, everyone started with one person and it's just building that up from the start. I think is the biggest device is just get started. Yeah. Like, just to the point of like, don't spend time on what your logo looks like or what your name looks like start proving it and then build a brand around it. So I think that's the biggest thing is just getting started. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Matt, thank you so much for you're the official first guest on the awesome. GM revolution podcast, but we're so happy to, so happy to have you here. And for everyone listening, we're going to be posting a little blurb about Matt and we'll kind of recap everything that we talked about in our featured heroes on our website. So go check that out. But with that, thank you, Matt. Uh, we appreciate you being here and so excited to see what comes with uh, the Arena Club. Thank you. I'm honored to be the first guest. I think you guys are really doing some great things. And this is the first, right? So yeah, this what, is the one. Yeah. What we talked about is now you're going to learn from what we've done on this podcast going into the next one and keep building a great thing. So awesome. best of luck and thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, thank you. Once again, we want to thank Matt for coming on the podcast. That was such a great story of how just going ahead and doing something can lead to places he'd never imagine. I hope you enjoyed listening. And like I said, you can learn more about Matt and how he has found a way to create a unique experience for his customers more on our featured hero page on our website, gmrevolution.com. And most importantly, if you know of someone who has a great story that deserves to be told, please send us a little blurb about them and nominate them to be a fe featured hero too. That's all for now, friends. I'll see you next time.